10 o'clock. Um, we'll get started in just a moment. Um, I just wanna make sure people are able to come in from the waiting room. Um, I'm Devin Waugh, the instruction librarian for NC Live, and I'll be fielding the chat um, and introducing our next two facilitators. Um, if you have any questions at any point um, or you're having any sort of technical issues, please feel free to private message me in the chat. I'm happy to resolve those issues one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this will all be recorded as Amelia has probably mentioned. Um, so if you're taken to the desk at some point or you have a meeting going on, you have to walk away from the presentation, that's totally fine as well. Um, so the title of the session is How I Survived Implementing Organizational Change During a Pandemic. Um, and it's being led by Leslie Mason. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to her. The host would like for you to speak. Oh, <laughs> I'm on. You're on. <laughs> Are we still waiting or? No, you're good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm always thrilled when NC Live asks me to present. Um, I, it's a little bit humbling, quite frankly. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about um, how I sort of survived the pandemic. Um, I know we all faced really difficult challenges um, over this past, gosh, almost two years. So I'd say we just kind of jump right into it. And I want to just go ahead and right out of the gate admit um, um, I didn't survive necessarily. So um, it's been really tricky. And um, I don't know, Devin, are you are you moving the slides forward? There we go. Yeah. So as you guys can see, um, even your best laid plans don't always turn out the way you'd like. Um, but as we kind of go through this presentation, you'll find that um, hopefully you will learn from my experience. I know I certainly did. And that you can avoid some of the pitfalls that happened unintentionally or just had to happen because of the situation that we were in. So um, next slide is going to let you know that the only way to address organizational change um, and maybe even flourish is to prepare. Um, and understanding that part of organizational change means that you are going to have to stop, reflect, change course, and change um, and change gears. So um, we are, are we on slide three? Oh, no. Yes, we're usually so good at this. Okay, so um, I had the honor of presenting at YALSA earlier this month, and I, I'll say, and there's a slide that sort of shows um, all of the different, uh, you know, when you Google library director fired, you get all of these results. And while I was at YALSA and talking to some of my colleagues and peers, it seemed that so many library directors um, had the same experience that I had. Um, and it, it, it just happens a lot. These are examples of, of library directors that didn't involve something nefarious, right? There's lots of examples of misappropriation of funds. And, um, you know, in Philadelphia, for example, they're having issues with institutionalized racism in their library. And I looked at and read about library directors where there was no cause given or um, it was something that happened in a clandestine way. And so just understand, especially for those of you who are thinking about moving into leadership, especially at a director level, it can at times feel more like a political appointment. And so you have to sort of operate in that world as well. And that's something that's one of those they don't teach you that in library school that being a library director is political um, and you will often just have to sometimes as the face of the organization um, be faced with with this type of result 
So on slide four, um, you know, we're going to prepare, we're going to be nimble. Um, and I, I want to ask people, you know, as you move into these sorts of things, and we can go right into slide five, you know, why do we have organizational structures in the first place? Um, and I think we all sort of just assume that, well, we have these layers of administration and we have these types of setups um, just because it's how we've always done it. But actually, organizational structures are really important and they, um, they help us achieve coordination of activities. They outline a reporting structure, which is really important. They define and hopefully improve workflow and they identify areas of responsibility. And it's really important to understand what type of organizational structure that you are in currently so that um, you can better understand where you are and what you're moving towards. So um, here's just one example of the different types of organizational structures. Of course, anytime you start researching something, you find out quickly that there's, you know, an ad nauseum list of, of these types of things. But these are the four major ones. And they're really interesting to look at when you start thinking about library service. Um, and it's, it's important also to remember that um, even though you don't fit into one of these categories specifically, often understanding where you are and where you're going is gonna help you be more successful, right? So when you look and think about libraries, we tend to be, and I, this is a funny way of thinking about it, like functional. And I use air quotes because I've been in libraries for years, starting off as an LA and working my way through. And there are many times where the library is not functional, but um, organized chaos is kind of how most librarians survive. So, but it's also important to understand that typically it's bureaucratic, everybody has a boss, it's pretty you know, structured, especially in your larger library systems. In your smaller library systems, you might be a little more flat um, and that presents its own challenges, but it really is important um, to understand where you are so you know that where you're going. So when we move to the next slide, you know, and think about being functional or maybe even a composite, um, it's you also want to look at what type of change are you going to implement? And for me, before I even came to the county, I tried to get as much background information as I could. There wasn't a lot out there. Um, it's a small community. There's only one paper. Uh, the local TV station is several hours, you know, an hour or more away. Um, and so there just wasn't a lot of concrete information about what was about to happen. I knew from the previous director what was happening. Um, I had talked to the state library. And when I got here and the more and more I looked at it, um, while research shows that there's anywhere from like three to 12 different types of organizational change, the longer I was in the job, the more it felt like not only we were we in each type of change, either we were going through it right then or we were going to have to go through it. So it wasn't just one piece. We really were fundamentally changing everything about the library. And um, I mean, we were talking about, um, this was a planned change. Um, we were, it was gonna be system wide. Um, we were gonna have unplanned changes, of course, when the, I didn't know this at the time, but the pandemic was gonna force us into a lot of unplanned change. Um, we were looking at remedial change, with ha which has to do with performance. Um, I mean, everything fundamentally was going to change. And that's really tricky to think about in the abstract. So it really truly wasn't until I was in it concretely and could see it that it started to really become real. So I, I included um, this really nice sort of sort of scale on, you know, what happens if it's just incremental change 
and radical change. And then if it's something that is that is impacting who you are as an organization, that core part of you versus like just something on the peripheral, like, you know, we're changing the way um, we empty the book drop, you know, that's sort of like a peripheral change. And unfortunately, I knew from the get go that I was in this high disturbance, high risk environment right away. So um, as I kind of got here and moved through, um, it really became evident that it was one of those things that you were just gonna have to tackle. You just had to eat the elephant one bite at a time. So um, on the next slide, it was it's really important to think about um, and over and over everything I've ever read about change leadership and organizational change is um, you have to think about the people involved. And it, it is definitely a people first situation. Um, and bringing staff through the process is the only way that it's gonna be successful, right? So it, it all is through training, support, um, employee engagement, um, and everything I've ever read about it talks about that piece. So um, on here, so I don't know if you guys knew this, I didn't know this. There were there are actually several different types of keyboard layouts. And um, the one we typically use, or that is used sort of universally, is that bottom piece, that Q-W-E-R-T-Y. And that was designed specifically by the manual typewriter industry, because as people became more and more proficient typers, they would move faster than the machine would allow. And so there was a lot of mechanical glitches and things with the manual typewriters. So that, that bottom keyboard was designed to make humans type slower. Um, so the upper, Key, keyboard, which was discovered right at the same time. It was sort of this, you know, here are some different layouts. It was so efficient that the technology couldn't keep up with it. But yet we are so resistant to change as individuals that we still use that inefficient keyboarding um, experience. And I just thought that that was fascinating. I mean, I have a hard time with the keyboards that's kind of split, so I completely get it. Muscle memory is real, but I just thought that that was an interesting example of how resistant, in it, you know, we are about anything. And um, it doesn't matter if you're a change agent or an innovator or an early adopter, you still have a pause when, when change is presented. Um, it's also really important um, to understand where your organizational is on sort of this um, left to right path, because you're not going to be able to do anything until you at, at least get folks kind of in this blue green area. You're never going to get everybody to your enthusiastic support, but if you can get them out of that active resistance, it's going to change. It's going to change everything. So, and. I just want everybody to sort of think about when change is presented to you at your library, what's your typical response? Um, because I think it's often overlooked that you as the employee, staff, person, middle management, um, you really are going to turn the tide of the change. And it's, it's a responsibility that we have to our patrons and our library um, to try, I know it's really hard, um, but try to understand that change is going to happen, that um, it, it should be, all changes should be intended for good. Um, I know sometimes it's hard to give admin the benefit of the doubt. And, and often too, remember, sometimes admin is also part of this of this change. A lot of things, quite frankly, were outside of my um, zone of influence. And I just had to try to make the best of it and communicate that with staff. So I had a handful of people who were excited 
about the prospect. Maybe they weren't so excited about the actual change itself, but the idea of it made them excited. And that helps me come to work every day. I have to admit that. And for those folks, I am always eternally grateful. Um, and when you're in it, I would just ask that you be kind and gentle to those who are trying to um, lead through. Um, it's just as nerve wracking for the change agents as it is for frontline staff. Um, but if, if everyone could start thinking about it as collaborative and beneficial, um, it really helps the process. So um, as we move forward, and I probably have talked into my next slide, but I have a tendency to do that. Devin's really good at kind of keeping up with me. So before I even started um, in this position, I had this really great sort of plan and it was going to um, involve, you know, just this um, altruistic, like, I, I am here for you um, sort of mentality of, I am here to help, right? I am here to help you through this unbelievably unique situation. Um, and the plan in my head was to just listen, was to just visit, listen, share whatever information I had and could, um, and just to provide the information. It was surprising to me that there was this bit of a vacuum about the organizational change that was happening, that was happening in Carteret County. You know, moving from the regional library system to a county agency is a huge undertaking. And so when I realized that there there wasn't a lot out there. I, I wondered how much internal dialogue was happening. So um, my goal initially was to um, just, just be that conduit of information. Uh, it, it's important to know, especially in the wake of the pandemic, and I look back, I, I didn't get to talk to every single person that worked in Carteret County for the regional library. Um, we were social distancing, libraries were closed, we had stay at home orders, and there were people that I, and it's not an exaggeration, I met one time before they either made the decision to stay with, with the library or not. So understand that you will never get to have that interaction with every single person that's being affected by your change. So you really have to find out how to maximize your reach um, and to find those influencers in your organization that change the temperature of the room. So find your, um, your folks who have a lot of influence and those are the people that you, you want to engage early and often. Um, I found what worked for me and what I think worked well for the majority of staff was having a hub for information. So we had a staff site, we had ongoing email threads, we had a hub for the information that was needed. And I think that that really, it worked for me. And, and I think, you know, staff may think differently, but I think it, it helped that people had a place to go. Um, I also very early on established a anonymous Google survey, Google form, where people could anonymously post questions. So there wasn't the stigma of, I want to know how much I'm getting paid, right? Because that's generally the most important, and it should be. Um, I want to know, you know, what's happening with, um, you know, job descriptions. I want to know how my benefits are affected. And so it was really important that they could ask those questions freely and without recourse or judgment. Um, so let's see, next slide. So I can get caught up. So I, I highly recommend um, if you are about to undergo, even if it's a peripheral change, find out what type of change management model speaks to you um, because, you know, you need something that really speaks to your leadership style and who you are as a communicator it's good. You're already implementing a lot of change. It's going to be hard for you to change who you are intrinsically as a leader, manager, motivator, change agent. 
And for me, John Cotter seemed to have the model that I felt more comfortable with in general. This is generally how I try to interact with staff. Um, and it also seemed to address the idea that we had a lot of simultaneous change and projects that were happening quickly, right? So this seemed to speak to me. And there are, I mean, an infinite number of change man management models out there. Um, even better, if you have the time and can, and I absolutely recommend starting now because change is going to happen at some point, start looking into this um, and see if you can even create your own hybrid. Um, that's one thing I did not do. I really sort of globbed onto this idea of this circular um, model. And so I often would have to take a step back and say, okay, this model isn't working. So I'm going to have to kind of on the fly um, figure things out. So um, I really encourage you. Leading Change is a, is a great book. It's a quick read. It's, it's small. It's available in NC Cardinal um, if you are a Cardinal library. So I highly recommend it. And also um, just a general sort of um, you know, landscape survey of change management models. And I think we're on slide 10, if I'm correct. Yes, so if you aren't familiar with what happened in, um, in this area, in June of 2019, Carteret County decided to leave their regional library system. Um, regional library systems are really important throughout the country. Um, I, I worked in Maryland for a long time as a librarian. They also have regional libraries, but they are structured completely differently. So in Maryland, the regional libraries um, are more of a background support role. And in North Carolina, regional libraries really are at the forefront in coordinating these uh, library systems into centralized admin. Um, it's, it's really great use of resources. It's extremely valuable. And, um, and so with that said, I, the only example that I knew of in recent memory was Lincoln and Gaston County um, was a two county system that separated. So the entire regional system dissolved, which was not the case here. There is still a regional library system that includes Craven and Pamlico County. So that in and of itself created a whole host of administrative problems because the incorporation of the regional really was vague in its language of what happens if one entity wanted to um, leave the system. It, I guess when it had been drawn up that the assumption was the options were, were in it or were out of it, not you know one person has elected to leave. So, I, so that decision was made in June of 2019. I'm also gonna let you know that the reason why I think it wasn't as um, widely talked about initially was because at the same time, there was a lot of disruption happening in the school system. They were talking about closing a school. So that dominated the news cycle. So this just sort of happened. People were like, huh? And the fact that it wasn't going to happen for another year, I think people sort of sort of focused on this, what was happening in the school system. So that was decided in June. Um, and then uh, I started as director in Carteret County of February of 2020. Um, at that time, the regional library director had um, retired. She was no longer with them. So there was an interim library director at the regional there, and then there were was me who came in in February. Um, with the implementation date of July 1st of 2020. Um, so as the fiscal year started, we were gonna start. So just as a reminder, I started in February, February 17th, on March 11th. So I hadn't even been there a month. The pandemic really truly hit. Um, so just to give you some context for what's happening. So. I think we are right. So this is what I quickly discovered. Um, it, it was 
it was more intense than I had initially realized. I knew this was going to be a challenge. Um, I get asked that a lot. Like, did you have any idea what you were get, getting yourself into? And I like to say, yes, I did. Um, I just didn't realize what that meant or was going to look like truly. So these were some of the large item issues that I noticed. Um, of course, staff were, they had, they had been worried about this for a year. Um, so they had lots of questions. And initially, you know, I didn't have a lot of answers, quite frankly. I barely knew where the bathroom was, um, let alone how the new organization was going to look and, and act. Um, just rumors were abounding. Um, everything from why this happened to why I was brought in. I mean, it just was, and, and you know, when there's a vacuum of information, information is going to be created. So that, that wasn't surprising, but um, I think just some of the nitty gritty items that were overlooked were really kind of hard to overcome. So, you know, I just sort of made my list and um, just, just jumped right in and really didn't have any choice, right? Because right out of the gate, we were faced with um, the pandemic. So um, let, we'll move on to the next one. This is just so you can sort of see some of the, some of the things. So as I was looking at, you know, sort of initially the sort of onslaught of, oh my gosh, this is happening right now. This was the list. This is the initial list of things that I realized we needed to do immediately. These were not things that could really wait. And of course, at this point, just to give you context, we're, we are, when I made this list, we were heavily into March um, looking at April. So as I'm sort of trying to figure out what's happening, the regional library is still operating. Staff work for the regional library. They don't work for me. I had a really great interim head librarian who was handling payroll and bills and um, and staff staffing, you know, if somebody called out or vacation and she was brilliant and wonderful and um, was really my right hand person um, up until the transit, we called it the transition, um, the transition. I'm going to write like a horror script and name it the transition. So um, I didn't have staff. It, it was me. I was the only library employee employed by Carteret County until July 1st. So I had a lot of time to sort of think about this, but understand too, I had amazing partners at the regional library. These were true professionals, librarians who really put patrons needs first and really looked at this as an opportunity and genuinely wanted this to be successful for everyone. Because think about it, their patrons are being impacted too. Folks that live in Havelock, people that live on in other little border communities of Carteret who were used to coming to Carteret branches as part of a regional, were going to be heavily impacted. The collection that moved between the three counties was about to get basically cut in half. There are five branches in Craven, Pamlico. There's five branches in Carteret. So just think about the organizational change that was happening on that side. And so we really quickly bonded over this issue and worked seamlessly and beautifully together. And I will forever be indebted to, um, at the time, the interim now director, Kat Clowers, because it could have gone south quickly if, if that entire staff, everybody from finance and HR and IT on the regional side wasn't committed to a successful project. So a question for the chat is, where would you start? Um, I think for me, um, the staff was at the forefront of my mind. That's the type of administrator I am. I'm always staff and patron focused. So um, for me, the staff training was really important, but also I had this fine line to skirt. I couldn't start, I couldn't start training these people on the, on the new ILS system, right? Because they didn't work for me yet. 
And um, I mean, everything was going to change. And I really couldn't even tackle it until they started working for me. So I started doing small things like evaluating the, the digital competency of the staff. Um, There's a really great program. Um, and I just, I just lost the name of it. Um, it's a digital literacy test. It's, um, it was started by Goodwill. Oh, now I can't remember it. The state library has a program going on with it. Um, but for me, staff was, was forefront in my mind of, I really need to, to help these people under, yes, North Star. Thank you, Beth. Um, it was, it was North Star. So we did some North Star assessments basically so I could understand where the staff were um, and how quickly we could get them trained on an ILS migration. Thankfully, um, this particular staff had gone through a couple of ILS changes already. So they were pretty flexible with that. That necessarily wasn't the scariest part for them, which was kind of great. They, they'd all lived through that unscathed. So it was less about that and more about what's my job going to look like? Where am I going to be? Um, you know, th those sorts of fundamental questions about each of them. So this is sort of an overview of things that I had, you know, decided were important. Um, and then um, if we want to move forward, um, here, here's where we are in the timeline, right? Um, we had a state of emergency in March. Schools closed on March 14th. The regional library closes to the public on the 17th. We had stay-at-home orders issued, and please understand, I am not directly um, managing directly the staff. They are regional library employees. I was just graciously given the opportunity to interact with them and do as much as I could um, in, an in an appropriate way. So um, immediately sort of the transition, it kind of got, I'm not going to say put on hold because I'm constantly sort of trying to line up vendors. I'm going through files. Um, I'm looking at what belongs to the regional library, what's going to stay with the county. I mean, just sort of that very fundamental, like breaking up, right? Um, we quickly use the analogy of a divorce. So when you break up with someone that you've been with for, you know, decades, um, you got a lot of stuff. And it was really important to identify who was going to take responsibility for what stuff. Um, so that was constantly happening, but we had to completely reinvent our service model because we're in a pandemic. Um, and so that became the, the item that was changing more rapidly, right? Was, you know, how are we going to serve the public while being closed? Um, you know, what do we need to get staff to do so that we could keep them employed, right? You know, a lot of people struggled with this. Libraries across the state were looking at layoffs. We're looking at how are we keeping people employed? Are we sending people to call centers? Um, and I will also say that a lot of staff in the regional library system began to utilize leave. They either had... Um, health issues themselves, or they were in a household where they had somebody who was immunocompromised. So we also simultaneously had a lot of areas where we were going to be short staffed. So that's just kind of your reminder and check in of where we were, you know, in the timeline. So now we're sort of in April ish, April, May, at this point, um, if we want to go to the next slide. We have a quick question from the chat. Oh, sure, great. Oh, thank um, you. So Brandy was asking, how large was the staff? When I initially got there, that's a good question. I think we had, see, they had a completely different way of identifying staff too. They had, um, they had substitutes, which I had never had substitutes in systems that I worked in. You were either full-time or part-time. Um, so it was over 40. And if I have anybody from my staff on there that can correct that if I'm wrong, um, understand they were not my staff. So I had a kind of this idea and I think it was more than 40 because right now we're at 32, maybe 33. 
so we, this is when I can tell you that we lost two entire branches of staff before July 1st through either um, folks who were just, you know what, I'm tired. Um, this is a lot of change. It's a pandemic. I have other priorities. I have a family. I have health issues. You know, new grandchildren that I'm going to have to help with um, at home schooling. Um, and so people just decided now it's not a good time for me to try to navigate this. And so a lot of people resigned. Um, two whole branches, no staff, and one branch lost half of its staff. So we were pretty much decimated um, before July 1st. So that's important to remember as well. So basically, yeah, I would say all, we probably lost almost 50% of the staff, which was not expected. Um, no one expected an, you know, entire branches to um, resign or um, they didn't apply with me, right? So maybe they didn't resign from the regional library, but the county needed everyone to go through the, the hiring process. They did not have any of that information. Remember, all of that was centralized in New Bern. So they needed um, applications. They needed um, you know, background checks. They needed to get these people signed up for insurance. They, I mean, we literally were brand new. Um, and so these people had to go through the process. That was difficult for a lot of people. They felt that that wasn't appropriate that they shouldn't have to do that. Um, yeah, it was, it sounds like a nightmare. Um, there were times where I wasn't sure if I was awake or asleep. I had one particular reoccurring nightmare uh, um, where people broke into the library. Like we, like a staff person went out to the book drop and before they could get back in, like hordes of people were just coming into the library. That was a reoccurring like, nightmare that I had. I think that was pandemic related or maybe it was everything related, but that was one that um, I remember. Um, so yeah, so that was that was something that was not, again, unplanned change. It's like, okay, well, all right, let's, let's regroup and move forward. So I think we are on slide 14 and I probably need to step it up a little bit. So at this point I realized, okay, um, wow. <laughs> So, so much for my buddy, John, and his idea of leading change and my pretty little circle um, was pretty much thrown out the window. Um, and I, I love this quote that I found um, in an article that I had read. Um, you can't change an organization like you change a tire, like you change a filter in your house. Um, this was a very emotional for everyone. They'd love, you know, their leader that they had had for decades had retired and moved on, you know, they're watching their friends resign. Um, they are in the midst of a pandemic. Um, they have more questions than answers. It became a highly volatile and charged atmosphere. Also, the branches are really spread out geographically. So physically, it was hard for me to get to everyone, besides the fact that we're, you know, we, we have to socially distance, we can't be in more than groups of 10. Of course, the thing I wanted to do was get everybody in the same room, right? I wanted all of us to get together, sit down and hash it out. Good, bad, ugly, kind of like the Thunderdome, right? Like we were just, it was gonna be a battle royal. Let's just all get in there and get through this um, together. I wanted to hear what ideas people had, or I wanted everybody to hear the same message, but all that went out the window. Same with the public. I had, oh, I had all these beautiful plans of town halls and um, open opportunities for questions. And I was gonna visit everybody and everything. And I think um, one of the things I did immediately um, was I went to, I started going to all of the town council meetings. I made it to three and there was probably like 10 or 15. Um, I made it to like Moorhead City um, and Cape Carteret. And I can't even remember what the other one was. Oh, um, Newport. And to talk to the town councils, to let them know, see my face, here's my contact information. Um, and yeah, I mean, I made it to three. There was no talking to the chamber. There was no rotary meetings. There was nothing. So I became part of the vacuum of information 
it was just really, and we're competing in a news cycle where people can't buy toilet paper. So nobody's really worried about the library, right? Um, until it's not there. And then people are mad because they can't come to the library. So, you know, it really was, um, it really was difficult. So I kind of in the moment found this idea of a nudge theory. And um, it's really fascinating. I had just started learning about it. It's not even from the business world. It, it comes from behavioral economics. And the idea is that when you propose um, a positive reinforcement and indirect suggestions, it, it, it slowly moves people in the direction you want them to go in a predictable way. And the best example I found about it is if you want people to eat healthier, put the healthy food right in front of them. And I think we do this as libraries, we don't even know it. You know, we don't put books, we shouldn't put books on the top and bottom shelves. Why? Nobody shops there. When you go to the grocery store, you shop these middle three rows. That's where we put the books. Um, and so if you want people to eat healthier, make the healthy food easily available, put it right in front of them. Um, you wanna eat less, use smaller plates. It's these, it's these suggestions um, that are reinforced with um, something that's easily adoptable, just reaching for that apple instead of that bag of chips, um, you know, are, you're going to slowly have people sort of in this idea that it was their idea. Um, it's, it's a choice architecture that influences behavior without any um, restrictions on choice. That's the important part to understand. It's not, um, you're not banning something. You are influencing the decision architecture of someone. So I really kind of globbed onto that because what I found in trying to sort of, now I'm, I'm trying to learn this on the fly while I'm also doing all of the other things that are happening. Um, if you look at this top corner sort of arcing um, um, depiction and, um, I very quickly realized that um, folks were in this model and the model up there and I can't, is it the Kubler? These all have like weird names of like men's names. Yeah, Kubler Ross model. So this model is based on the stages of grief. And I quickly realized that this is exactly what was happening to Seth. They were grieving um, heavily um, and you know, some of them were still in shock. Many of them were still in denial. I will make a side note that most of the community was in denial and in this denial frustration mode um, after we're in April, May at this point. Um, staff had moved into this sort of like frustrated depression dip. Um, it was just, I mean, they're doing things um, that aren't as impactful as they once were. We're not doing programming. Um, they're, they're doing all these webinars. They don't understand why they're doing them. Um, this is when the regional library started weeding. I think we all did that. We all decided, you know what? No patrons in the building, deep weed, baby. Um, and so that is also emotional for a lot of people. Not everybody loves to weed, which I still can't understand, but I love it. Um, and, you know, that can be upsetting for people, especially it was told to me by staff. And so this is conjecture that they hadn't done a deep weed since the last ILS change, which was like five or seven years ago. Um, and remember too, this is the entire month of June and July was it like one day. Um, so it, it needed to be done. It hadn't been done. I'll also note um, the branches very much operated as a silo. And the best way to describe it was we had a system of libraries. We did not have a library system, right? So ordering happened differently at each branch. Um, shelving happened differently at each branch. And so weeding also happened differently at each branch, sometimes not at all. So um, when I realized that, that I was working through grief um, and I found this nudge, theory, things started getting a little bit better, I think. And I could see it in the staff as well. So next slide. Yeah, so this is what I ultimately used. <laughs> um, um, and I said this a lot um, to staff 
especially um, now that we were in May and June. Um, it became it became what what's on fire the most, which at that time, I think they were even like wildfires in California. So that was probably not even a great um, analogy. But um, I would literally ask, like, is this something that's just smoldering? Or are we fully engulfed in a dumpster fire? And if it was not fully engulfed in flame, I was setting it to the side. Because at this point, um, the timeline for the ILS changeover changed dramatically. Initially, we were going to be able to stay on the regional ILS until, well, they were going to extend it into October just in case. NC Cardinal was not going to be ready for us until September. There's a reason why you have to apply a year in advance for NC Cardinal. They got a wait list. Um, so it, I then found out that um, we would have to leave the regional ILS on that July 1st date. Yeah, every, I just felt the collective gasp. Yes. So yes, I had to change ILS systems Im almost immediately. And I had only done some of the tertiary things that needed to happen. Um, there's lots of decisions to make around NC Cardinal. Um, there's lots of forms. First of all, they do it beautifully. And thank God for the NC Cardinal staff. Um, they, um, they made the magic happen. They're just, they're wizards. I don't know. Um, they are these godlike creatures who just magically do things. And because they're so good at it, I was able to migrate um, in record time. So quickly the ILS became the thing that was the most on fire for me. Um, and, and so, yeah, this, you know, again, we're in June now. Um, I need to hire, you know, 15 people. Um, I think too, and we can move to the next slide. Um, you also have to remember that I'm dealing with a county who had never had their own library system. They would write a check every quarter to the regional library system, and that was pretty much the extent of their involvement. So they had a lot of change to go through as well. Um, and I don't, I don't think, in, and the county's dealing with a pandemic. You know, my procurement problems, probably not top of the list, right? So, um, you know, I created the staff site. Um, one thing that I'm really glad I did because then it, it got it in writing um, was I sent an email almost immediately. I took that Google doc or that Google survey of questions and literally grouped similar questions together and typed out everything I knew. Um, that way it was in writing, number one. Number two, everyone was reading the same content. Um, and number three, it was a document that I could refer to. Um, I also ended up using some of that as a script with patrons who would call with all kinds of questions. When the newspaper would call, I, I pretty much had a script written. So FAQs are your friend. Um, I, did, I did go to branches as much as possible. Um, thankfully, regular meetings with the regional library kept me sane. Um, and as, as much as I could, regular meetings with the county manager. That was tricky because he's off, you know, trying to set up, you know, COVID hotline things and, you know, all of that. So, um, you know, this this is sort of a touch point of, of where we were. And there's our pretty new logo that happened um, kind of instantaneously too. So next slide, we're getting low on time and I'm like halfway through. So this also happened. Um, and because I was so ingrained in the ILS changeover um, and it was just fast and furious, this kind of happened um, and this impacted my staff much more than it impacted me. If you look at some of these, um, most of them are about me, right? It very much became personal and I became the face of the change, even though I didn't make the decision happened with, you know, happened 2019. Um, it didn't matter. And that's something that when you are a change agent and the implementer of change, you have to, that skin has to be so incredibly thick. Um, so staff's still really concerned. Now the community has been rallied. Um, 
the county is starting to feel the, the pain of a library in the sense that we didn't have the right, we didn't have a technical services office. I mean, we just didn't even have the space to absorb the things that were happening, happening centrally. Plus the timeline got ramped up by several months. So at that point, no one was happy with me. And so I sort of felt like, well, I must be doing something right because everybody's mad. Um, and I will say just as a little asterisk, most of these letters to the editor were from the friends groups. So um, that was a surprise to me um, and something that unfortunately I didn't realize the smolder had turned into a flame, right? So next slide, cause I gotta, I gotta hurry. Um, I just wanted you to sort of see that. So tried and maybe I should have been more proactive with this, but um, we did a social media blitz. Here's my response to some of the rumors that were happening. Someone said we were getting rid of like 70% of our collection or something, which would have been over a hundred thousand items, which obviously was not the case. So I started posting pictures of the things that we were weeding. I started showing pictures of new books. I had a really kind of salty staff member who I loved, who um, one of the letters to the editor was that I was um, anti-military, which that's lovely to hear when you live in a military town. So she did a display that we posted on social media of all of our military books, which I thought was really genius and um, smart. So we, we tried. We tried. Oh, that's a screenshot of me doing my live Facebook live Ask a Director, which I had hoped to do every quarter. But remember, I'm down to branch staff. I'm down branch managers. Like um, it just was one of those things that a traditional library director would have been able to do. But I was serving. I had multiple hats. So um, next slide. So I, I do want to let you guys know, and this was shocking to me um, in a lot of the research that I had read going more, less going into it, thank goodness, and more of when I was in it, that um, change is rarely successful. Um, something like 50% of the change um, doesn't have the impact Oh, no, no. Yeah. 75% of all transformation efforts don't deliver the results that you were planned for. And 50% of the change doesn't even happen at all. Right. So when I, when I saw the stats, I was like, Ooh, so I felt a little bit like Rocky, you know, like, um, you know, we're, we're going up against, you know, Apollo Creed. So it's really important. And I, that I was, I was very transparent with things that, that didn't work. Best practices weren't going to work for us. We were in a completely new environment. Nobody had ever done this before. Um, I love, this is not something that we did initially, but I think we were starting on this path. And if you Google it, it's fascinating. It's, it's something that a lot of fortune 500 companies do and it's called kill the company. So it is a scenario where, where your organization is stuck in the status quo. This is how we always do it. Well, what happens when um, your company gets um, bought out or taken over or something? You have this new product that directly challenges who you are as an organization. Um, if you find your service gaps or tech gaps, whatever your gap is in your library, if you discover it first, you get to fix them you're not doing it retroactively. So the kill the company scenarios can be really fun in team building um, and can be a great tool. And I didn't have the luxury of, com of combating the change fatigue. We had to change. We changed our phone numbers. Like we changed everything. Um, and it, it was just how it had to be. And people were exhausted before we even got started. So um, next slide. And, and I wish there was, I could have come up with some way to fix that, but there wasn't. So here it is um, on a timeline. Um, I broke it up between fiscal years because that was really how we looked at things. July 1st was go, was go time. Um, things that I'm super proud of in September of 2020, which is when we opened to the public, um, we served 8,000 items that month. September of this past year, we more than doubled our circulation. Um, and if, don't tell me that weeding doesn't increase circ, man. Um, yeah. 
So that is something that I, I really appreciated. And you can just sort of see there was something every month and it was something huge every month. Um, there were also things that I proactively did that we could celebrate. Um, we got an NC IDEA grant. Some of my closest colleagues were like, you applied for a grant? What the heck? Yes, because we needed to have these positive things. We did an entrepreneurship seminar um, and that was some of our first virtual programming. Um, it was a huge system-wide thing. We had a grant for it. Um, we got several grants last year, um, over $20,000 in grants. Uh, and it was things that we could celebrate and talk about. Um, student access um, was a lifesaver for kids who were stuck at home doing um, virtual learning. So um, just so you can sort of see how it went month by month. Um, we, we did get our employee staff day, which also kicked off our strategic plan. So that happened in October. Um, and we'll, we'll go to the, to the next slide because you all can look at that um, next time. So to wrap up, um, you know, ultimately I did lose my job. Would I have done things differently? Of course. Um, I have Monday morning quarterbacked this to death. Um, and I, I mean, there are times where I think I would have done everything differently. But then I remembered, you know, there were so many circumstances uh, outside of my control um, that I don't regret it. Um, I also want to note, and it was somewhere on a slide, so I, I might have overlooked it. You know, the fact that every, like all of these entities that I was dealing with was also going through the change, it's important to understand when you're thinking about the community, when I was thinking about the county, you know, those zones of knowledge, like I know what I know, I know what I don't know, I don't know what I don't know. Um, I quickly realized that the county was in the, I don't know what I don't know. Um, when I said I needed a technical services office, and I kept saying that over and over, um, they said, well, you'll be using the county IT department. And that's when I realized that they didn't understand what tech services meant. So I had to explain to them, no, 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 we're talking about 20 and 30 boxes of delivery in and out, tens of thousands of items being processed. Like this is library tech, not IT tech. So it was those basic fundamental things because they had never done this before. And I kept, I would have to reiterate that to staff a lot. The county's never done this before. So we need to give them grace and space to understand who we are. Um, as far as what's next, I'm not entirely sure. I'm like a lot of my colleagues in the sense that is this, is this what I want to keep doing? Um, I'm finding out quickly the longer that I'm sort of away from admin and I am working. I, I work for the regional, the, the Craven Family Care Regional Library now, which has been wonderful. It's given me the opportunity to remember my passion for service. And you have to be passionate if you're going to institute change. Um, and so it's still there. Um, it's just, you know, I, I'm in my rehabilitation stage. So um, I know we don't have a lot of time and that was a lot of information and I even sort of glossed over some stuff. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, I want to thank everybody. I hope that this was helpful. Please email me if you have specific questions. I'm always happy to share. I mean, you know, I would never want anybody to go through this, um, but hopefully you gained a little insight into the change process. And if anything, if you weren't open to change at the beginning of the session, maybe you can think about being a little more um, open to it, even if it's just for the sake of, of your coworkers going forward. So um, I, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I'd happily take questions. Yeah, folks, feel free to submit questions. Um, <clears throat> All the book recommendations, um, I definitely want to check out later. Um, Amelia dropped a link to a folder with all the slides for today. So if you want to check them out. Um, I do have a resource slide. Yeah, yeah, the next slide is just like lots of fascinating articles <laughs> that I found. Um, and, I, and again, it, this is kind of one, and we're librarians, like you, you get into this rabbit hole. Um, but these are these are some things that I found. I thought, wow, these are really great. And I have them filed away, so I wanted to share them. Lauren in the chat made a, a really good comment. Um, most people don't want to share their diff deepest, most difficult learning experiences, which are often the most meaningful. 
And I want to thank you so much for um, providing this kind of bird's eye view of everything that happened um, and sharing your experience. This, yeah, I mean, I have to say thank you to everybody who is being kind and generous um, with your comments. This was hard for me as a as a program because I felt like I found myself quickly trying to defend myself to my colleagues, right? Like you're most vulnerable to the people who know your work the best. And so I had to really quickly realize, like, I don't have to defend myself to, to folks. You guys understand what I was going through. Um, and I did learn a lot. And, you know, this is, this is a, you know, nobody wants to get fired. But, you know, um, it's part of it sometimes. And some really great librarians and library directors, even in North Carolina, have gone through this, too. So, so thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being generous. All right. Well, we will take a very quick break. Leslie, I'll include your email um, in the follow up. Um, and thank you <clears throat> again so much for taking the time to do this today. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. All right. I will see you all again in just a couple minutes.